Good afternoon. I'm number 10. I'm the last one. And I thought because of that, I should talk about the future. So basically, as you can see, I will be talking about the possibility of a global, of a green global golden age. And I will be doing so taking into account historical experience. There are two questions that are very common today or that you probably have thought about. Uh, one of them is, are environmental policies an obstacle to growth, as many economists and policymakers claim? You know, lots of people say we first get grow go growth going and then we're going to take care of the environment. That's one possibility. Uh, but then there is also something else. There are some other people who say that growth is an obstacle to environmental sustainability and those happen to be a lot of the environmentalists. So my question is, do you think either of them is right? Actually, with an understanding of innovation and of the history of technological revolutions, in my view, the answer to both is no. The environmental problems can be turned into solutions, not just for sustainability, but also for growth and well-being. So also for social sustainability. And I say that because of an understanding of technical change. So we have to begin by trying to understand some features about technical change. The first observation, important observation I want to make is that technological advance is constant, but it's not continuous. We normally think of technology as this thing that progresses. You know, it's progress. So you have it going on and on and on. That's not really wrong, but it's not exactly right either. In fact, the way technical change progresses is by successive surges of transformation, global big technological revolutions that come across the economy until they exhaust themselves. And once they are exhausted, the next one starts taking shape and then there is another big wave of technological change, a technological revolution. And each of these big surges of transformation opens different potential directions for growth. There have been five technological revolutions in 240 years. The first one began towards the end of the 18th century, the so-called Industrial Revolution, when we had the introduction of machines, factories, and canals. Canals were the internet of the time. Each, each revolution has this a huge infrastructural network that mobilizes either just information or information or just people or just things and so on, but basically it changes the conditions for market access and for information access. The second revolution begins around 1829, the age of steam, coal, and railways. The third, around 1875, is the age of steel and heavy engineering. Uh, heavy engineering, electrical, chemical, civil, and naval, and that was the first globalization. There are reasons why this is an important one for us to understand, because this is the, the one we're living now is the second globalization, so there are parallels with what happened then. Uh, that was the time when, thanks to uh, transcontinental railways, transoceanic telegraph. Can you imagine telegraph cables in the 1870s were going all the way from the UK to the US and across all the way to India, undersea cables. I mean, it's, it's quite an astonishing thing, but it was amazing for the people of the time. Can you imagine being able to send a telegram to India and there is a ship waiting there and you send an order and, and the product goes right on top of the ship and then it comes in two weeks rather than two months going with the order and two months back. We're talking about huge changes for those people it was as amazing as the internet is for us today. And of course, that incorporated the whole of the Southern Hemisphere into the global economy. 
Then we have from 1908 with Ford's Model T, the age of the automobile, oil, petrochemicals, and mass production. That's the one we're still trying to get rid of. That's the one that created all the waste, all the plastic, all the pollution, all the you know, excess energy use, excess materials use, and all these things, and, and obesity. <laughs> okay, so we are now in our current revolution. From the microprocessor in 1971, we can say that the age of information technology and telecommunications began. But that arrow is only halfway. And that's one of the things I want to tell you today. Every revolution has two periods, and we are precisely midway along the process of diffusion of this particular revolution. So I have good news for you. You still have a big way ahead to transform the world with this revolution. And the next one, what could the next one be? Well, we don't know. But one thing we know, it is that the next revolution never begins out of nowhere. There is always technologies in gestation, which are sort of the frontline technologies, and they are the most likely to make the breakthroughs that will make the next revolution when this one has given all it can. One of the things that happens with revolutions is that because they create uh, conditions for investment and innovation along certain uh, sort of common sense directions, everybody uh, sort of continues along that way rather than wait for a completely new revolution for which nothing is ready. So these revolutions begin in one core country. Up to now, that has been the case. The first two began in Britain, the second two. The, the third was in both Britain, USA, and Germany. In fact, USA and Germany vied for leadership and the, and the US took over after the war. So the next two have been USA, and we don't know where the core country will be. Maybe it will be in various, maybe, maybe it'll be in China. Who knows? We will find out. You will find out. I might not be around. But anyway, it takes around half a century to spread across the world, radically changing the paradigm for best practice. The paradigm for best practice. Do you know what that means? That everything that was normal Everything that brought people to success with one paradigm, all the logic, all the common sense that brought people to, to wherever they are, big bosses, big politicians, whoever is up there in power, got there by using the logic of that particular revolution. And now we have this very annoying thing that wants me to change and do everything differently. It is not easy. It's very bumpy. So. The shift that comes the, the, with the information revolution has many aspects. I'm going to give you a list, but the list is infinite almost. We begin by distinguishing between mass production processes and flexible, adaptable, high volume production. Mass production meant that you produce the same thing the whole year, every single day of the year, the same, 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 same. We, ha we used to have models of cars. Every year you had a new model. Now. You can have it every three years, every three months, every two. It doesn't matter. There, there is the possibility of changing very flexible lines of production. Then we had closed pyramids and isolated firms. Just, you know, the boss and the several layers and the people at the bottom just did whatever they were told. Now we have open networks. We have platforms. We have that at the local level, at the global level. We have a completely different way of organizing, much flatter than the big command and control structures. Then we used to have stable routines, now continuous improvement. Routines were so stable that manuals were printed. Can you imagine instructions printed forever? And now what's happening is that you're constantly changing continuous improvement by, by the actors, by the users, by a sort of Linux type situation uh, is happening in many areas. Uh, we go from human resources to human capital. Human resources people were like raw materials. You know, you put the machine, the raw materials, and the people who were just human resources. Now we're talking about human capital, creativity, uh, intelligence, knowledge, imagination. All those things are extremely important 
they're recognized as such, and they're recognized in salaries, they're recognized in all sorts of ways, and not just as something that you put into the process of production. Then we go from Tayloristic organizations where you know exactly what you're going to do and you just do it, you leave your brain at home. You were actually told to leave your brain at home because there were some technical people who decided exactly what you had to do. Of course, now we have learning organizations, so all participants contribute, you learn, you improve, everybody's improving, everybody is changing for the better. What's happening for the better of the company, for the better of the people, for the better of the institution, wherever you work. Uh, it used to be that you had the company and then you had the suppliers on one side and the clients on the other and you know you kept them at distance because they were on the other side, you know, the company was this close thing. Now we have value network partners, so we actually collaborate with the suppliers, we collaborate with the users. The users give feedback, you know how many times we are asked what did you like, what didn't you like, give them, you know, everybody wants to know what you liked and didn't like because they want to know which way to improve, right? So that was never, that never happened before. What do you mean? Why didn't you like too bad? <laughs> you know? it, it just wasn't in the game. Now it is so normal, you people probably cannot imagine not having to give your opinion. Sometimes you don't like to, but... Uh, another thing, fixed plans. Did you ever hear about the five-year plan? Five-year plan of a company, five-year plan of a country, five-year plan, everybody had to have five-year plans and then you knew exactly what you were supposed to. Nobody talks about that. Now you have a strategy that has goals, that has direction, that has, but not, not something that's already written and you know exactly where you're going to get because things change all the time. Economies of scale was the main way of getting higher productivity. Now you have economies of networks, economies of scope, economies of specialization, and of course, also economies of scale. Uh, internationalization, now we have globalization. And when I say internationalization, it's because normally you had nations were pretty much closed with lots with tariffs, lots of protection. There was a time when you couldn't even move your money around easily. Uh, now we have globalization, which doesn't mean that there are no frontiers. It doesn't mean that there is no action from the state. On the, op on the contrary, in order to have globalization, which is the really the globalization of the economic activity, you have to have, not only at the national level, but at the regional level, at the local level, very active governments that will shape the direction in which things go. This whole institute is dedicated to thinking about public value, thinking about public purpose, thinking about what governments can do at all levels in order to transform the space in which a particular citizenry moves so that the economy, both the local economy and the part of the global economy that will be located in your country has the best possible outcome. So we're actually talking about a different, very different idea from this thing that globalization means that the state is out of the game. It's the opposite. The state is more in the game than ever in order to get proper globalization. Uh, three tier stable markets, big, medium, small, expensive, medium price, cheap, and so on. That's the way it used to be now. Highly segmented dynamic markets. When you go into a supermarket, you find the million cereals. It used to be three brands, three sizes, you know, very simple. Now you have everything from diet to, to super taste, to organic, to non-organic, and so on. And obviously, no environmental concern. Now the environment is the main guide for innovation. That's pretty big. I mean, we're taking the whole range, and that's not a complete list. For you, everything that's on the right seems pretty logical, right? Well, it didn't seem pretty logical to the, to the people who had to live through it in the 80s and in the 90s and the people who are going through it now who are still stuck in the old mold. So in fact, it is a radical change in best practice common sense. It is gradually and very unevenly adopted because it's not easy. Digital natives have it easy. Non-digital natives have it difficult. And that's one thing that has to be understood. I think that today we have two glass ceilings, one for
for women and one for the young because we're living too long. So lots of people are in positions of power. You know, it used to be at 65, at 65 you more or less left. Now people are going 70, 75, 80. That makes it more difficult for the young to get up there. And until the young get up there, we don't get a proper change because they're the ones who every decision will be taken, who will take every decision under with the new ideas. So anyway, it's not easy. And that brings us to a second observation that's very important about technical change. It's that it doesn't just happen smoothly. It happens in a very bumpy ride. Uh, if we look at the historical record, we will see bubble prosperities, recessions, and golden ages. We have first an installation period, which is the early decades of a revolution, then a turning point, which is the time when you have all the problems showing up and then you get the deployment period when you get the best of the revolution and that's when you get a golden age. So we have two different prosperities. We have a bubble prosperity in the first decades, then we have a collapse and the recession and then we get a golden age prosperity. So it's two different prosperities, the, pros the unequal, uneven prosperity that we have had with finance being at the top and then we get another prosperity which is what's been called the golden age so in the first one we had the canal mania then we had the canal panic and after that we get the great british leap with the napoleonic wars a triumph in there and so on then we had the railway mania the railway panic and after a couple of years we get the victorian victorian boom uh, in the first globalization, we had the London funded global market infrastructure build up in Argentina, Australia, USA, New Zealand, all over the southern hemisphere and in the big colonies like the US and Canada. And then we had collapses and in each of those countries. And then after that, the Belle Epoque in Europe and the Progressive Era in the USA. And then we have the Roaring Twenties in the next revolution autos, housing, radio, aviation, electricity. Those were the things that were in the boom then. Then we get the crash of 29 and the long, long, long 1930s. That was 13 years with the world war in there. Very tough times when all both poverty and political turmoil and things happened and the war. And then after the war, we have the post-war golden age. This time we had internet mania, telecoms, emerging markets, and then the first, the first bubble collapse, which was in 2000. And then we get a boom, another boom a few years, and then we get the global financial casino, the housing, the whole big bubble again, another bubble collapse in 2008. We might still have another one because things are equally bad and we are not, we don't seem to be getting really out into a golden age prosperity. So the question of whether we're going to have a global sustainable knowledge society golden age, which I think is perfectly possible, uh, is, is still in the air. So if we look at this, we have the first few decades, which are the ones that today have now, are now behind us, hopefully led by finance with unfettered markets, and then the next few decades led by production, guided by the state, and between them where we are now. We are now in a historical equivalent of the 1930s. So for the ICT revolution, the current time is equivalent to the 1930s for the mass production revolution. So how can I say that? What's the nature of this turning point, of this moment like the 1930s and now? Well, it's about structural unemployment because of technology and this time also because of globalization, de-skilling, hopelessness, inequality, casino finance, low investment, feeble growth, social unrest, populist messianic leaders who find a lot of followers, xenophobia, it can be the Jews, it can be the Muslims, it can be the Mexicans, it can be whoever, it's always going to be somebody who's taking my job. And in fact, many other things are taking your job, but you know, it's easier to find, so you have that. You have economic migrations, talk of secular stagnation, political cleavages, we'll talk about that in a minute, 
recessions, and even depression. So it's a pretty ugly time. It's a very difficult time. It was a time when, in the 1930s, it was really difficult for the great majorities, and it was very, very difficult to imagine a better future. And in fact, the better future was there. So we can learn that from that. And the reason why the better future can be there is because there is a huge underlying technological potential that lacks a clear synergistic direction that can only be given by the state, can only be given by government. So another fact that we learn about technological change, about technological revolutions, is that every paradigm shift leads to a realignment of the political spectrum. This is what we get. Because we have a paradigm behind us and we have a paradigm ahead of us that is not yet totally clear, there is a division among all people, be they uh, of the sort that think that have collective values and goals, which people could call the left, or the people who have individualistic values and goals that people could call the right, everyone for himself. So, but then there is this other division that divides them both, the ones that look backward and think of what they thought was great in the past and what should have been done and da da da. And then you have the ones that are looking forward, trying to imagine a different future with this new situation. So traditional parties divide, new movements emerge, and success, for better or for worse, requires understanding and shaping the new potential. So it is not possible for somebody who wants to make America great again, meaning go back to coal, or meaning anything that has to do with how it used to be, go back to how we, it used to be, no unless what you mean is let make it, let's make it great in a different way so that people now in a different way can have a better life. So it's just a question of understanding that going back is not the solution. We've got to go forward. So let's look at how it was in the previous 1930s, in the previous um, turning point. The question is, how was the mass production revolution politically shaped? Well, the space of the possible with every revolution is very wide. We had Nazi fascism, Sino-Soviet socialism, and Keynesian social democracy. They all used the mass production revolution. It was the exact same set of technologies. There were not three sets of technologies. So technologies don't determine which way we go. Politics determines which way we move the technology. So look at the range, look at that wide range. That's what happened. Fortunately, Nazi fascism was defeated on, in time, except in Spain and Portugal, which unfortunately suffered for quite a while. Sino-Soviet socialism lasted quite a bit. But as soon as the revolution was exhausted, they had to do something. So we had Gorbachev on one side, who failed, and we had uh, she, um, then Xiaoping on the other, who has up to now been very successful in shaping it. Will it continue? I actually believe that it's perfectly possible that it will continue that way, that it will not turn into a democracy like some people think. But anyway, look at the differences. This is very important. So let's go back now to the Keynesian democracies. What did they do? What directions were given to that set of technologies that were available at the time of the Second World War and after it. And what did the Keynesian democracies do? Well, there were two main directions. One was suburbanization. The other was the Cold War. Suburbanization gave the possibility of home ownership and mass consumption. And the Cold War gave the possibility of widening the spectrum of the new forward-looking technologies in order with, with the purpose of war, but anyway, that's how they were doing it. And of course, with very high taxes and the welfare state. And when I say very high taxes, I'm not just talking about Sweden. I'm talking about the US in the 1950s. The top rate of tax was 92% for about 10 years. 
with Eisenhower, who was a Republican. So we're not talking about something that happened only in a few countries. Taxes were very high in order to have a socially sustainable and uh, legitimate society. Now, how did such directions turn into policies to bring the post-war boom? Apart from the Keynesian management of fiscal and monetary policy, there was massive shaping of dynamic demand for mass production. Infrastructure for low-cost suburban housing. So the government would put the infrastructure and then the developers would come and build cheap houses on cheap land because suburbia was cheap land, whereas in the cities land was very expensive. Government guarantees for mortgages. Have you people heard of Fannie Mae? That was created at the end of the 1930s in order to let the banks lend to people on salaries. They were used to lending for housing to people with wealth, not for to people on salaries. What if you lose your job? Well, the government stood there and guaranteed and would actually buy the mortgages. So that's what was done then in order to get workers to be able to buy houses. Unemployment insurance and pensions. What's unemployment insurance for? Ah, you would say, well, for the workers to be able to eat and have their thing. It's also for business not to have to get uh, cars returned and, and the refrigerators returned because everybody was buying installment on monthly payments. So if you lose your job, every time there is a recession, you will be returning the key to your house and all the electrical appliances and the car. So obviously that was a positive sum game. And that's the whole idea. You say a golden age is a time when you have a positive sum game between business and society. And government creates this positive sum game. And the pension, of course, also so that you could spend your whole salary every time because you were sure that in old age you would be protected. Official labor unions to maintain salary increases. Uh, free education for the majorities and sometimes also health. Farm subsidies, prices low for consumers and profits high to buy equipment. Military procurement, fostering high tech innovation, as I said before. Massive government employment and high taxes to pay for it and the Bretton Woods Institutions for International Finance and Trade. That's the real explanation of the middle class society. I want to tell you something very important. A lot of people are saying that all the middle class jobs went to Asia. That's not true. What went to Asia were the jobs that when they got to Asia became low paid jobs. So it wasn't the jobs that were highly paid. It was the social political decision to pay high salaries to workers that made the difference. So it's not in the nature of the technology, it's not in the nature of the job, it's a social political decision. Each golden age enables a different lifestyle and the lifestyle creates new jobs. So even if the technologies destroy jobs, the lifestyles create jobs. So we had in urban Victorian living in the mid 1890s when lots and lots of things were made for the home. Cosmopolitan living in the Belle Epoque, again, we had there new jobs in services, in culture, in entertainment, in all sorts of things. Suburban family living, which is the one in the post-war where everything was manufactured down to, you know, food and cans and tins, the whole thing. And there were lots of, but there were lots of new jobs in construction, in services, in retail, in all those things. So technological revolutions do destroy jobs, but they increase wealth creating potential because they increase productivity and they increase average productivity. And with higher average productivity, you can pay high salaries, even in those other jobs that are low productivity. So that's the whole one of the obligatory uh, reading that that is in your uh, for this course. Uh, we'll talk about that, about the role of lifestyles. So, the best precondition for a successful policy is an understanding of the context being faced. Keynes worked because national economies with mass production and consumption of identical products made and used with cheap oil and materials, mainly for the domestic market with stable homes, with stable incomes for lifetime jobs. So that's uh, the picture that Keynes fixed. What's the picture that we now have to face? 
globalized economies with WTO watching, with flexible production geared to diversified global markets, with potentially expensive energy and materials, hopefully expensive so that we stop using them so crazily, in a context of rapid innovation with unstable changing jobs and facing environmental limits. So we're really in a very different thing. So we need to keep the aims of Keynes while adding a new Schumpeterian understanding to design a new policy framework for dynamic innovation and markets in, in the information age. I hope you people know a little bit about Schumpeter. Maybe one of the other, thing, uh, other lectures has talked about that. So what could the directions be now? Smart green growth in production and lifestyles and full global development. Now, what's smart green growth? It is a constant increase in the proportion of intangibles in GDP and lifestyles using information technologies and improving the life of the great majority. So we're talking about services, 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 intangibles, intangibles, and we've already seen that the movies, the books, the, the, the music, everything going into, and then uh, more and more things are going into intangibles. We have to move more of them and we have to change our lifestyles to have less material goods. An accent on preventive health, exercise, caring, creativity, learning and experiences, favoring renewable energy versus fossil fuel, favoring services rather than products, favoring organic and fresh food over canning and freezing uh, uh, and pending to local production. The circular economy for tangible products with biodegradable materials. Drastic reduction of waste, massive increase in reuse and recycling. Making durable products durable. That's a joke almost to call them durable and they don't even last five years. Uh, and shifting to a rental model. It's perfectly possible to shift to a rental model. Seriously reintroducing maintenance with 3D printing of parts so we don't have to make spare parts. We just print them when we need them and so on. So changing the aspirational way of living, changing the luxury life, what's a good life, while making it possible by modernizing the welfare state. So we need to do both at the same time. And why would full global development be in the interest of the advanced world? Because it's only if the advanced world wants that we will actually get it. Apart from the obvious humanitarian side, it would provide demand and high quality jobs for advanced country specialization in capital goods, engineering, equipment and high tech goods. So it actually would widen the market. What we need, we need to have the proper demand in order to get the proper jobs. It would multiply trade flows across the world, less concentrated in China and Asia as they are now. It would reduce poverty, violence and therefore migrations and so on. So we saw all the problems at the same time. We solved the migration problem, which is angering so many people. Most people who migrate don't really want to migrate. You know, they have no choice. They're, they're migrating because they, have, they see something better and their life are, are horrible. So if you make their lives better, there'll be less migration. But if at the same time that creates jobs where people are desperate about the migrations, then you have a win-win game. So the ICT revolution naturally favors globalization, but society must shape it for environmental and social sustainability. So we need two sets of policies, policy innovation to change the context and institutional innovation to modernize government. You know what? Governments are still bureaucratic. They're still in the old mold. And that has nothing to do with whether they're innovative or not. I mean, governments can be infinitely innovative in what they do and infinitely innovative in how they do it. But we can't just push for innovation. We have to also push for changing the way government itself works. It has to be a modern organization, a platform organization. So I'll give you some ideas for changing the context. Actually, I think I might not have enough time. I have five minutes. Okay, let's see if I can do it in five minutes. So some ideas for changing the context. Change tax on capital gains to favor long-term investment. So it would be high for capital gains made within one day, which is what high frequency trading is about. Then 
still high for a year and then very low or maybe nothing when you get to 10 years. So actually favor long-term investment. People committed to companies when they invest in them and people committed to their investments. Tax energy, materials and transport rather than labor. Uh, regulate for durability and maintenance. Tax products and purchasing, not services or rentals. If you were to tax VAT only on when you buy. But if you rent, you don't. Then lots of people will want to rent because it'll be better. And lots of people will want to have the business that rents. Facilitate the sharing and collaborative economy of all, at all levels. Set up flex security and basic income. Basic income is probably one of the most important things to do in a society where uh, the gig economy, the Uber, the, you know, all these things that make and, and self-employed. You, you can't just have an unemployment insurance in a society where employment is no longer for life and it's no longer permanent. We've got to think of something else and I think basic income would do it, but it's very controversial still. Set up a new New Deal aimed at education, skilling, and long life reskilling. You know, lifelong, sorry, I meant <laughs> lifelong reskilling. That is, it used to be that possessing a house was the most important thing for the future of anybody. Well, today it's possessing skills, it's possessing an education. That is the most Im important investment for every individual. So if all sorts of policies were made to facilitate buying houses in the past, why in the world shouldn't we have this time facilitating the most important capital good that people can have, which is an education of all sorts. So the new deal should go there. Invest in the new infrastructures, charging for electric cars, smart grids, uh, fiber to the home, etc. Set up a new Marshall Plan for the lagging countries. Supranational arrangements for global taxes, including financial transactions tax. We cannot continue allowing the biggest companies escaping taxes in, in every country where they, where they are uh, in their siege and, and where they have their business. It, it is absolutely unacceptable and I can't believe that it's been years and we still have the same thing and nobody has set up some decent way of getting taxes out of, out of the big companies and so on. And of course the policies need to be as bold and imaginative as Bretton Woods and the welfare state. Uh, so, you know, this is not bold or imaginative enough. We need much more and I'm sure in all your other lectures in this course you have had a lot of things that have to be done. And you know, we can't be frightened. The level of changes that has to be made is enormous. And if you look at the level of changes that were made uh, in the golden age, I already gave you a, a very incomplete list before, it's no more than that. It's just that it has to be as adequate to this revolution as that one was to the previous. And then let's look at some aspects of the modernization of government. New institutional arrangements for consensus design of strategy and policy. Up to now, governments are used to just command and control. You know, they take the decision and people have to accept it. We need consensus design institutions. We don't have institutions for that. Put the general direction of innovation at the center of growth policy. That whole thing and all the missions and everything that we can do to orient uh, growth policy as an innovation policy, strengthen capabilities and organizations towards creative, flexible, agile and knowledgeable government, governments that really, really connected with the people but also very creative and very agile, maximize devolution to empower local and city governments and encourage local strategies. We need to have everything all the way supranational, national, local, super local, everything we need, much more participation in deciding which way to go. Digitize and make simple citizen participation and public services. Uh, I don't know if you had a lecture from the one who did the US, I um, can't remember his name now, that's terrible. Anyway, participate in shaping and accepting supranational institutions with enforcing power. That is one of the most difficult things now that we have all these nationalist movements, all these populist nationalist movements. 
But we do need not only European Union, we need supra, tr truly supranational institutions because finance is supranational, global companies are supranational, they must be, there must be some authority that's capable of handling the things that are by nature supranational. You can't do it from, from every country separately and in competition. Be bold about taxation and about the services provider, provided and so on. So our institutions and policies today are like the early automobiles. You know what that is? That's not a horse and carriage. It has no horse. It has horsepower under that guy who's driving. And he's not even, you know, they didn't even turn the wheel up. It's still like the reins of the horse. You know, so, so really, that, but that's how every innovation happens. It begins with the old things and just the essential changes. And then you have to change fully. So that's the problem. A great innovative potential is there, but we're still trapped in the old ways. To go from there to the automobile is going to take a long time. A global sustainable golden age is possible with the ICT revolution, but austerity, unfettered markets, and a minimal and passive state, bureaucratic also, will not get us there. In capitalism, society shapes and is shaped by technology. Understanding and harnessing the potential of the information and communications technologies for shaping a sustainable future is the challenge of this generation. Thank you.